Can I ask you to pull out your mobile phones? I'll do it with mine, too. Uh, open a browser. Go to the YouTube page. And try to find a video by Googling for the keyword Spain. Now, can you try to click on the first video that you got, the first result? I hear a lot of buzzing. Let me guess what's happening. We are well into the month. So I guess that for most of you, you already ran out of your data plans. And I'm not sure that you were able to watch the video at a very high quality. For those of you that were smart enough to configure the Wi-Fi network, maybe you fear a better chance. But given that there are 300 of you trying to pull the same video at once, I doubt that was the case. <clears throat> what I'm almost certain is that for all of you, before you managed to start watching the video that you intended to watch, you actually had to see a small commercial, a small video commercial. And have you ever wondered what happens when you click on that video? What happens between the time that you click on your mobile phone and you start watching it? Well, let's imagine for a moment that you're connecting to the local Wi-Fi network. What happens when you click in your mobile phone is that you connect to that wireless router up there. The wireless router connects to a router that is sitting somewhere in Plaza Catalunya and connects you to the city network that then connects you to another router that is sitting somewhere in Madrid, that connects you to the national network, and then it goes to either Amsterdam, London, Paris, through the international network to land normally in some Nordic country. Nordic countries that host large data centers, spaces where there are a lot of computers that are probably hosting the videos that you're trying to watch. Why in such places? Because you want to keep the temperature down, you want to keep the cooling down, so you keep the cost down. You end up basically landing into a large refrigerator. Now, that network <coughs> that is helping you do all those things is ever increasing. It's getting more and more complex. New networks are getting added all the time. New devices are getting added all the time. PDAs, laptops, PCs, computers, washing machines, cars. And have you ever wondered how all this gets paid for? At first, you might start thinking, well, I pay with my monthly bill. Um, that pays for my wireless internet data plan or for my monthly broadband capacity. But that is only part of the question. <coughs> the same complexity that runs the internet today also runs the finances of the internet. And uh, uh, yes, you pay with your monthly bills, but the internet also gets funded through public institutions, through universities, through research centers that uh, set up infrastructure. It also gets funded by large corporations that cover uncover areas or rural areas or that provide free hosting services for bloggers to uh, uh, post on, on their sites. And finally, it also gets paid for by your data, by your personal data, by your privacy, by your data souls. And I would argue that we are entering a perfect storm. The perfect storm is one where multiple components come together all at once and create a result that is much bigger than the sum of any of its individual components. It tends to happen, for instance, in the weather when there is a lower pressure front that is coming in one direction, and then you have a high pressure front coming in the opposite direction. They both meet and then they create a storm that could sink the biggest of the boats.
And I believe that the internet could be going through a similar situation. This ever-expansion of capacity could be going through a similar situation. And there are four reasons why we could be going into this perfect storm. The first one is what you saw. <clears throat> we're consuming more and more video over the internet. The second one is we're consuming video over the mobile internet, and wireless capacity is limited. The third one is that we're getting very used to paying uh, flat rates with all we can eat. And the fourth one is that, as individuals, we're getting very used to sharing a lot of our data, our social activities online. Now, one could think that technology could solve all of this, that we just need to sit, wait, and that it will magically get solved. I've spent most of my professional life building a better internet, a faster one, more scalable one. And something that I'm noticing is that at a certain point, we hit some hardcore limits, <clears throat> limits that are not technology dependent, where these large data centers, these networks, they need to be managed, sustained 24 seven with security personnel, with engineers, cleaning operations. And they also need to be cool down and they need to be power to the electricity. And unfortunately, the cost of personnel and the cost of energy are not coming down at the same speed at which Moore's Law's capacity is improving. That's saying that capacity doubles twice every year. And even if magically we were to find the technology that is going to solve this problem, we as users, we are so good are using everything that we have in front of us. If it is not high definition video, <coughs> it will be 4K. And if it is not 4K, it will be 8K. The bottom line is that we're getting to a point where we will need to revisit some of the paradigms of how we got here. <coughs> and but at the same time, we will need to rethink very well how we keep the internet open, and how we keep control of our privacy. Content providers, consumers, and internet service providers are becoming imaginative to go around this problem. And one of the solutions they're providing, content providers are saying, well, <clears throat> let's go for something that is called sponsored data. Sponsored data, sponsor data is a very simple thing. What it basically says is that it will be the content providers that will pay for the bills on your mobile phones whenever you access their content. For instance, a, a movie studio may pick up your phone bill <coughs> for the new release of a um, movie clip, so you don't have to pay for it. In the same way that when you download a book on Amazon Kindle, you don't actually pay for the data that is consumed when you're trying to download that video. All this may sound good at first. You know, what's not to like to have more free access to the services that you like, which then in turn will boost more of the capacity deployment. <coughs> Let me tell you what happened in Chile. <coughs> in Chile, there was a service where citizens on their mobile phones had free access to Wikipedia and Facebook. Anything any data that was going to these sites, they would actually wouldn't have to pay for it. And about a few months ago, the Chilean government passed a law <coughs> forbidding their citizens to have free access to Facebook and Wikipedia. Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, if you step back for a second, the Chilean government argues <coughs> that by doing such practices, you could actually be giving a fair and fair advantage to those content providers that already are well presented in the internet and that the nascent companies may struggle to become the new Facebook. I am not sure whether this is the solution or not or will be the impact at the end, whether such practices will hamper or not the deployment of uh, uh, new early services. On the one hand, Small companies do not require a lot of resources, 
And then could, one could argue that as they grow, they should be able to finance themselves. But then on the other hand, picking winners and losers, you, we could end up breaking this very fragile landscape that we've created and that so well have served us for a very long time. What I'm certain about is that we are entering a new era where we're going to see large-scale experiments of non-neutral internets driven by consumer demand. But let me ask you, do you think the internet is neutral today? If you look at the ad <coughs> that appear on your phone and you compare it to the ad that appear on the phone of your, the person that is sitting near you, you will realize that most likely those ads are very different. The internet is full of ads, advertising and e-commerce, which pays for a large portion of it. And internet advertising, as opposed to traditional advertising, is very different, has very different properties. Traditional advertising is the one that happens on TV, that happens on newspapers, that is based on big data, is based on large statistics, consumer reports, large trends. But when you see an ad on TV, the TV doesn't need to know which channels you browse before. And when you see an ad on the newspaper, the newspaper doesn't need to know which are the newspapers that you read before that one. The internet is very different. It relies on personalized advertising. <clears throat> personalized advertising that caters to the needs of individuals, to caters to very niche consumption that tries to match together a sea of small to individuals. It goes to the of the organization. It caters to the online shop in Barceloneta trying to sell uh, a snowboard or for the local travel agents. But if advertisers, if wouldn't have personal information about you, it would be almost impossible to match you with the right things that you're trying to In fact, if you look at advertising today on the internet, <clears throat> the top 10 advertisers are not on the internet that much. They only account for about 5% of Google's ads revenues. But for internet advertising to work well, <coughs> they do need to know about your intentions. They do need to know about your preferences. And that happens through your browsing profile, through your search queries, through your location information. And yes, you may feel unease about knowing that uh, the ads that you're watching and that are sending you to some e-commerce site, so uh, they are steering you to buy a certain camera, or they are steering you to buy certain clothes. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of what is paying for the free videos, uh, newspapers, uh, a lot of the online sites, and a lot of the infrastructure that is hosting it, the cloud. Amazon, being the largest retailer in the world, is the company that ended up invented, inventing the cloud. And the problem is that there is a very fine line between personalizing your experience and breaking your privacy. There is a very fine line between giving you a good service and taking your data soul and selling it to the devil. Researching our lab has shown <coughs> that if we are not careful, we could end up with an internet that is different for the rich and an internet that is different for the poor. An internet that is different for Mac users and that is different for PC users. Where chip flights get hidden from Mac users and shoes cost 20% more 
if you just happen to read Forbes magazine. Basically, an internet that is more expensive depending on who you are. And the problem is that the internet is a shared resource. It's a shared resource that we all use and that we need to take very good care of it. It's a resource that uh, if we don't take care of it, we may end up in the tragedy of commons, depleting the most valuable resource, which is people's trust. And I think over the coming years, we're going to have a lot of important discussions because the different elements of the storm are coming together and we will have to discuss about alternative ways to keep the internet open. An internet tax service, more competition, corporate social responsibility from large companies, and um, the donor system. But the more worries in part is how we're going to keep your privacy from being eroded. I think we're going to move from an era <coughs> where rather than discussing so much about net neutrality and bits and bytes, we're going to start talking about data neutrality, about keeping control of your data soul and making a good use, good use of it. So while you are alive, you can take that data and use it for the best use for yourself. And when you die, you can leave it as a data wall, will <coughs> to your children. You can share it with your loved ones or you can donate it to science, to so so researchers, and, and solve the grand problems of humanity. I think we are at a turning point, and we'll probably need to open a number of discussions about the type of internet that we want and what are the solutions that we will need. But I'm certain about something. <clears throat> it is very important that we step back and that we take care of our data soul and we let it flourish in a data-neutral internet. Thank you.